Today is Thursday, July 2nd, and this is a meeting of the um, CEDC subcommittee. So um, we want to do some kind of roll call or. Um, yeah, Mandy, do you want to do a roll call? I guess, please. Yep. Mr. Weddleton. Here. Miss Kennedy. Here. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Constant. Mr. Dunbar. I'm here. This is Mr. Constant. Thanks. Miss Salatel. Here. Miss Quinn Davidson. Here. Okay. And the members. Um, so there is a quorum for that. And then non-members, Mr. Rivera. Mr. Perez Verdia. Miss Allard. Here. Miss LaFrance. Okay, Chair, you have a quorum. Great, thank you. Um, so I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but there were some uh, handouts that were um, emailed to us that Mandy emailed just probably about 10 minutes ago. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, um, actually, Mandy, we have we have actually about five things that you sent out to us. Um, so one is the current uh, AO, um, the 2020 uh, 58 that we've been working on. Um, there is a conditional use application form. Um, we have the CEDC work session. Um, so I'm assuming that uh, somebody's going to take us through that one today. Uh, and then what are the other documents? I guess I haven't even seen these. Oh, OK, so then there's Mr. Weddleton's thoughts on the conditional use permit um, for a homeless and transient shelter. And then you should have um, just a copy of the agenda, which basically says we're going to talk about homeless shelters. So, um, uh, well, let's go ahead and. Um, I'm trying to think who might really want to open this up. John, I know you've got a lot of thoughts and Meg. So um, John, let's just start with your thoughts on how we move forward with some of the um, amendments and changes to uh, AO 58. Madam okay. Chair, if I may interrupt real quick. This is uh, Chris Shooty, Director of Economic and Community Development. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I apologize uh, for interrupting you as you were handing the baton to Mr. Weddleton. Uh, <laughs> Some of the uh, two of the items that were provided to committee members uh, come from the department. One is a PDF version of a slideshow we'd like to give um, uh, at the beginning of the meeting to help orient the members in their discussion around the various zoning uh, code requirements for homeless shelters. It shouldn't take very long, uh, but we'd like to uh, we'd like to give it because it helps. We think it will help provide some needed um, foundational terminology and, and concepts even when it relates to our zoning code that could help the discussion and in particular the decision point uh, that I know some of some of the members are wrestling with of uh, does this become a conditional use or does it follow a new special land use permit process um, so if you're with your uh, approval we'd like to do that to set the stage well yeah that makes sense I just thought since it had the title on there for the work session you were saving the best for last or something but anyway no that <laughs> makes sense so go ahead Mr. Schutte. Okay well thank you for doing that I'm actually going to turn it over to Michelle McNulty uh, who I believe will be sharing her screen to show the presentation. Okay great and we great. do have a copy of that so thanks Michelle go ahead. Great thanks um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now hopefully successfully. OK, can everybody see the um, the work session presentation? It's up on my end, so I would assume everybody else has it. So. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And um, yes, yeah, so maybe this should have been a, a, a brief zoning. The title should have been brief zoning 101. So I apologize for the confusion. So um, a lot of this is because we're, we're kind of talking about new topics. This is a public meeting, so I apologize for people who this is redundant information for. But as Chris said, we wanted to kind of just set the framework and the context and make sure everybody 
was working with the same definitions and understanding of the process. So um, I'll try to get through these really quickly, but you know, we do have zoning districts and it's just a section of the city in which zoning regulations and standard are uniform. Um, permitted uses are permitted and it uses that are permitted without any special administrative review and approval. Um, however, they even though they are permitted by right, they still are subject to the standards and requirements of the governing ordinance. So in, in Anchorage's case, they're still subject to Title 21, uh, Title 23, and all the ap other applicable codes. Uh, within zoning districts, you have permitted uses, conditional uses. Conditional uses are those uses that because of special requirements or traits may be allowed in a particular zoning district, but only after review by the commission and granting of conditional use approval, imposing such conditions as necessary to make the use compatible with other uses permitted in the same zone or vicinity. There are also special land use permits, and this is a special, a specific approval for a use that has been determined to be more intense or to have a potentially greater impact than a permitted or conditional use within the same zoning district. Another term we keep using in this conversation is conditions of approval. So that's an affirmative uh, action by a commissioner or council, the assembly in Anchorage's case, indicating that approval will be contingent upon satisfaction of certain specified stipulations. And then just for clarification um, to any members of the public of the distinction between the assembly and the planning and zoning commission, the assembly is the legislative branch of the municipality that's charged with setting policy for the for the for the city. And the planning and zoning commission is a group of people appointed by the assembly that administers planning and land use regulations on a right array of land use and land use policy issues. Um, I've, oh. Just a slight nuance there, appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the assembly. Thank you. And I can update that if this is to be used in the future. So thank you for that, that clarification. I've gone over um, verbally the conditional use process in several other settings with this group and members of the public, but thought it might be helpful to kind of put it in a more of a graphic form just to illustrate the different points of entry and of public um, outreach and public comment um, through the conditional use process. So, you know, there's starting with the pre-application meeting, which doesn't necessarily have the public uh, comment period, but it is the opportunity for an applicant to bring the municipality um, a proposed idea and it allows the appropriate um, reviewing agencies and departments to, to weigh in on that and, and the concerns that they need to address through their application. Um, there's the community meeting before any application can be submitted. This does require public notice uh, 21 days in advance that an item is going to be at that community meeting. I do wanna emphasize that code actually mandates that the first choice for that meeting shall be the, the community council in which the project sits. If another venue is chosen, um, the applicant's actually required to provide documentation as to why and justification um, for the reviewing board to actually to look at. Um, Applications are submitted almost immediately um, once they have been confirmed complete. We do issue uh, a case number. They get uploaded into our City View system and they become available for the public to review and comment at that point. They also get routed to various agencies, departments, and the, um, the community councils that are affected by the, the project. Um, <clears throat> All of the comments that we collect get put into a staff report, which includes recommendations with any uh, proposed conditions of approval and is ready uh, and for at least one week prior to the public hearing. Um, the public hearing is a set date that's tied to the application deadline. It's usually about 60 days from when you submit your application to when your next available public hearing is. Um, and then 21 days before that public hearing, <coughs> 
planning department is actually responsible for sending out notice that 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 item is going to be on the appropriate applicable board or commission um, and then public testimony is taken um, both from the applicant and members of the public and even members of the public who have provided uh, written comment during the, the comment period may testify and then the commission makes the findings of facts they accept or modify conditions of approval and then take final action I want to um, to note that these are the the current uh, conditional use application and standards under current Title 21. This um, all of the other homeless and transient shelters that have been approved to date were under old Title 21. A significant difference between that um, old Title 21 and current is um, there used to only be four standards that you had to address. Um, now there are nine, so there's definitely a lot more um, items. I won't go through all of these, but I did include the full conditional use application for your reference, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about these standards as we as we talk about this item. And then, you know, we've talked about a lot about use ex um, specific standards and what those might look like. So I wanted to just share an um, example. And so this is for adult care facilities with three through eight persons. Um, so this is right out of Title 21. Um, the use specific standards include that, you know, they are intended to be minor commercial activities. They shall not detract from the pr principal use allowed in the district and shall not place an undue burden on private or public infrastructure greater than anticipated from a permanent development. And then in all residential districts, these facilities shall be located only in single family detached structure, excluding detached condominium units. These facilities shall be prohibited if the only direct access is from a private street. And I just wanted to Ms. illustrate. Oh. Yeah. Well, go ahead and finish that sentence, but I have a question for you. So yeah, so just quickly to, to wrap up. And so on this one, the reason why I wanted to show this is there is a lot of times the, the, the illustration we were providing was more you know that a certain landscape type would be provided as a use specific standard but this illustrates that oftentimes it can be much more than that um assembly member kennedy Great. yes thank you um I, we have a question from Ms. solitel yeah oh thanks Ms. kennedy um uh, miss mcnulty can we go back to the the flow chart on conditional use that slide yeah oh i went too far so this is where I think uh, the public is sometimes dissatisfied with conditional use um, is really, oh, poor puppy, whoever's puppy that is. Um, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> My instinct is to like hear the puppy and be like, oh. Um, but anyway, under the agency and department review, when we get to that last bullet point, staff completes the report mm -hmm. one week prior to public hearing and then 21 days prior to hearing those notices go out, I find that the frustration I get from the public, and I'm just raising this as we talk through these issues because uh, passions will be high around shelters, um, is that that mailed notice comes in and then folks go into city view, but the staff report isn't there yet and it's not due yet. And so they don't know ultimately what the recommendation is, yet they're trying to give their comment. So that timing feels frustrating um, to a lot of folks or they've given their comment um, and then you know maybe a written comment um, and then the staff report comes out and then they have a different comment or another comment so I just wanted to kind of highlight that my experience with that process um, and that tension between those two items um, as we move forward and talk about this okay I appreciate that note um and I don't know if you just want me to put a note right now and then maybe as we move forward in this conversation, we can talk about ways. I mean, there's there's reasons why we have these dates set, um, but there might be things that we can do to help educate the public as they look for information as to what to expect and when certain items will be available. So um, I, I don't think we you intend to have that conversation right now, but I just want to make sure that you don't before I move on. Uh, yeah, no, not right now. I just wanted to highlight it when I saw it so that Great. when we move into what we might want to do or as we have that discussion, that that's a part of the discussion. Great. Thank you. And thanks, Michelle. Before you move on, I think we have a question from Mr. Constance. Okay. 
Thank you. So all of this is illustrative of an ideal situation. And then you go pre-app, community meeting, application submittal, agency department review, public hearing, and then the doors open. And then two years later, the train has come off the tracks. It's a living nightmare. And there's nothing that anyone can do to stop the train from continuing to destroy the neighborhood. So what's the other end of this process where we move towards resolving of the conflicts that arise from an operator granted a continual a conditional use, but intentionally flouts them and doesn't do anything to fix the problem to the point where neighbors are forced to sue, they prevail or they settle, and then conditions continue to get worse and worse and worse, they sue again and the muni says you can't sue us again. And so ultimately we find ourselves in a situation with an unbreakable knot and the winner, of course, is the depraved operator. So how do we see the next part of this process where we can move towards a community's concerns actually being addressed? Yeah. Um, Through the chair, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer, partially not answer that question, but um, uh, Mr. Constant, the tail end of the process is one that um, uh, can apply equally, whether it's a conditional use process or a special land use permit. So we'd like to get through the definitional portion uh, of the presentation, and then we can come back because those questions occur at the tail end of this uh, arrow diagram that you're describing. Um, okay. So we'd like to finish first. Know, if possible. That's just definitely where my uh, concern lies. Thank you. Thanks. And and so I only have two more slides, so I'm wrapping up quickly. Um, so again, those are just the use of specific standards. Um, and then just some examples of uh, conditions of approval that we that the plan department has added um, and that planning and zoning has accepted as part of approval. Um, so hours of operation restricted, restricting them to certain days and times um, and having requiring that an annual report providing very specific information in this case is uh, is for a gravel extraction and so the requirement is that they have to provide a log um, of complaints on an annual basis and how those complaints were resolved and they also have to update the the department on how much fill has been removed and that helps us track um are they on you know timing with um where they said they would be in, as part of their application. And then also um, providing the contact name of the operation manager and their contact information, requiring that that not only be displayed in a public, um, it should say at the main gate, but at a very public um, accessible point at a property. And then also providing the similar information to the, the community council that's affected and then also requiring that the operator is required to keep that information current and in updating the community council of any changes. And so um, that, and then the next slide I'm going to go into kind of is going to talk about the special land use process. But I think this is um, something that we can come back to when we address uh, Assemblyman Constant's uh, point about what do we do two years later. And then the Michelle, last slide. Before, oh, yeah. Michelle. Yes. Before you move on, I want to give Mr. Weddleton a chance to ask a question because it may be on the one of the previous slides. So, okay. Mr. Weddleton. That's okay. Go ahead and finish up. Thanks. Oh, okay. Go ahead, okay. Michelle. Thanks. Okay. And then um, I just wanted to also illustrate the special land use process. And we only have this process for alcohol and marijuana. And so I just kind of showing this and really it it mimics in a lot of ways the same process that's required for um, the conditional use process we don't require the pre-application meeting there is the requirement for the community re meeting which follows the same requirements that um, are for conditional use permit so the applicant has to provide the 21 day notice they have to select the community council as the the first choice for their venue they submit the application, application is reviewed. It's also um, public comment is collected and then the department prepares a proposed uh, resolution for assembly consideration. That public hearing is also uh, noticed 21 days in advance. And just like for a conditional use permit, there's public testimony um, also taken by members of the public who have provided comments um, previously during the comment period and then the assembly approves with conditions or they can deny and so just wanted to share 
as we have that conversation about the two processes, how they may um, dovetail together or, or anything else as we have this conversation. And that concludes my presentation. And thank you for giving me this time to provide this. Great, thank you, Michelle. That actually is really helpful. It's always good to see charts and graphs. Um, Mr. Weddleton, thank you for the next question. Sure, I think you know one comment is on your chart on the process like for conditional use. Um, the assembly can also do those things. Like we'll get a rezone, we may change some of the conditions that may be put on it sometimes. Um, and of course with marijuana, we can do that. But, and I think what you just described, because uh, we, um, so is it either or you get a conditional use permit or a uh, slop? Or is it something you might get both? So um, you, it is something you might get both. And restaurants are, uh, restaurant and bar is a good example. So um, typically anything with a marijuana or alcohol license, if the use is permitted by right, then it the only thing someone getting a marijuana or alcohol license will be required to do is get the special land use permit. But we do have some uses that still require conditional use. Um, so the Girdwood Brewery is an example. That use is allowed in their zoning district subject to approval of a conditional use. So they went through both the conditional use process um, as well as the special land use process. Um, but oftentimes restaurants and bars are permitted in the B3 zoning district, and that's usually where they're at. So oftentimes they're just going through the slop process. And yes, you're correct. The assembly also does those um, same, same actions as the commission where you also modify, accept, or deny uh, conditions of approval. Okay, and can I follow up briefly? Yeah. Yes, please. So, um, okay, given that, I th what we have been driving at it at our previous meeting, and uh, I think someplace we want to land is um, the two years later, you know, it's conditional use seems pretty fixed. Um, like, uh, you know, we have a license for marijuana we can pull. So. I think we're looking for something like, okay, we'll set some standards for conditional use. And I've sent like four pages of a collection of possible things. Um, but then how do we pull it? It's not working out and we're going to end it. With any of what you've shown here, where would ending something fit in? So I don't know if you can see my screen. Can you see this slide I just pulled up or are you still seeing the main presentation? I see you. You see me? No, we see the conditional use oh. process slide. <laughs> um, let me. Let me just have some different. Well, I'm on your um, I'm on my desktop on your um presentation. Okay. What page? Let me. Well, it's a different. Let me just. I'm pulling up a new slide. Oh. And so it's taking a second. Um, I should have said it as a PDF, but it's the enforcement slide. And so tile, tile 21, actually 2113, the enforcement section, I'm going to talk as my screen hopefully pulls up, um, actually speaks to that. And under 2113030, uh, and when the screen sh comes up, it will actually have the, the, the verbiage. I'm going to see if I can do this a different way. Uh, can you see that screen? Yes. yes. Great. So um, it actually talks to that. So any activity inconsistent with entitlement. An entitlement is a conditional use permit, a major site plan review, or a slop. It's anything that is required to, to make a use allowed if it's not in, permitted. And so um, this actually provides the power to the director to, to revoke a entitlement if there's um, certain things that, that happen. And so under the 2103-040-A2, it lists those out. And it specifically goes back to if there's a material or substantive de departure from the approved plans, specifications, limitations, or conditions. So not only is it saying that if the development isn't in line with the standards set forth in Title 21, but that if that development is not um, in compliance with the conditions of approval 
or limitations put on the property or project that uh, or operations that it can be revoked. Um, and so I think in previous conversations I've mentioned a, a big portion of this is really making sure that we have conditions of approval or use specific standards for this use that are measurable that we can go back and um, and have uh, basically let the um, revoke if we need to. And okay. Michelle, this is Chris Shuey. May yeah. I add to that? Yes. So Please do. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Wellison, <laughs> part of your earlier comment was about um, the the role that the assembly plays, and um, I want to highlight this slide and that comment because. Uh, what we presented today and what we're talking about are zoning regulations, but the example that you gave earlier, I believe, about marijuana or alcohol special land use permits, those are two-step processes or two levels of approval that are required. You have a licensing requirement for that particular activity, uh, and then you have the land use component that allows them to exercise that business license in a given area. And so the enforcement actions that Michelle is describing is only specific to land use uh, uses. If there was a world where, like marijuana and alcohol, homeless shelter providers needed to be licensed, that could potentially be a second level or second lever of control over the activities of that given licensee. So I just wanted to highlight that point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've got several people lined up with some questions on this, so I'm going to start with Mr. Gates. So, Dean. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. First one is, uh, uh, maybe I missed you explaining it already, but there's a difference between the conditional use process flow chart and special land use permit flow chart. So the first step in conditional use is the pre-application conference. That's required for the special land use process as well, isn't it? It's missing from that slide. Um, what, so I, I'm going to refer to, I don't know if Ryan is on the call, Ryan or Francis or Dave. I don't believe that it actually is required by code. I think people choose to, but it's not a requirement. Um, I don't know if okay. there's any. It's optional yeah. for both conditional use or special land use permit. It's an option. It's not required. Michelle, this is Dave Whitfield for special yeah. land use permits. Um, let's just say marijuana, uh, a pre-application conference is not required, whereas yeah. with a conditional use permit, uh, it would be required. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, my follow on question, uh, I think who mentioned it? Uh, how do assembly members and their relation to the conditional use process when the uh, approval is by the Planning Zoning Commission? And uh, I think because of the heavy amount of interest of assembly members in homeless transit shelters, some of them may be want to appear before the Planning Zoning Commission with their comments during the public hearing and so forth. And uh, I think though that the um, code of ethics has something to say about that in 11570. And so what is, I guess, uh, Michelle or Chris, your understanding of uh, whether or not assembly members can show up to give their own testimony about a particular homeless or conditional use application? I'm going to defer to Chris on that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course you are. <laughs> Sorry. So, Dean, um, that that's a very good question, and I think there has there are two things, two ways to answer it. One has been the historic practice of the assembly, which is to um, allow public processes to play out um, in the in the manner that they are prescribed in code prior to getting engaged. That's number one. Number two, there is a code section in Title 21 in 2102090B where it's describing land use procedures and the role that the assembly plays in that. 
And in particular, there is a uh, provision that says where a board or commission has authority under this title to review and comment on a land use matter, the assembly shall not take action on the matter until it has received and taken notice of the review comments and the recommendations of the board or commission. And I believe the way that assembly, the assembly has historically interpreted that code provision is we don't get involved until the matter comes to the assembly. Now, obviously that's tough from time to time when there are land use issues in front of a community and that community is represented by an assembly member. Um, but uh, historically that has been the role that the assembly has taken, which is let the process play out through the code uh, provisions. And then as the assembly gets a particular entitlement action uh, uh, on which they have final decision authority, then they can uh, take up the matter. I'm going to interrupt. Chris, what about those items that don't come before us? Yeah, and, and that's that's a great right. question. Just to just to go to the chair. I believe that the uh, language that I just read grants that discretion, right? So where a board or a commission has authority, the assembly shall not take action on the matter until it's received recommendations from that board or commission. If you aren't a part of that final decision making process, is it appropriate for an assembly member to, um, for example, submit public comments uh, on a action that doesn't come back before them? Um, I, I would say that the, you probably have the legal authority to do that. Um, I just don't know if that's mm -hmm. a practice that the assembly historically has followed or would want to follow at this point. But Dean probably has a, a thought on the matter. I think he does. He's typing in. Oh, um, sorry. I was thinking it, I pasted the language that Mr. Schuette was reading from code at um, 2102.92 B2. Uh, is that the right section? Yes. Yes. Okay. And when I was reading that, I missed the last thing you were saying. I think that uh, it was about assembly members, right? And um, appearing or participating in the commission use process. Um, there was in in the code of ethics. I think that. Uh, because of their position, elected officials can appear to have an ability to exercise and do influence, you know, so generally they're discouraged from appearing before boards and commissions to give their own testimony. Um, they can't appear on behalf, and I'm actually reading from ethics code, a private interest before the assembly or appear on behalf of a person in an adjudicatory matter before an appointed body. And so the conditional use process, uh, it is an adjudicatory adjudicatory matter because it is about um, private rights and entitlements. Uh, isn't that correct? This is Michelle. That's my understanding. Yeah, through the chair, that is correct. Yeah, there's a couple exceptions. And uh, those are just if they have um, elected official and assembly member has an ownership interest or private interest in the matter. So, you know, like if they were within the zone of being publicly noticed and their properties nearby might be affected, or um, if they're showing up at the request of the appointed body. So I don't think assembly members could show up at the uh, planning zoning commission's public hearing process or throughout their whole condition use process, unless they're asked by the commission to show up or if they have property nearby the site, the application site. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure our assembly members understand that. And this sort of leads to um, my other question. You uh, had mentioned, there was mentioned earlier um, that uh, uh, Michelle and Bob, Chris had explained maybe or discussed a hybrid process with Ms. Salas. Oh, um, that's not in your slideshow. Is that something that's still um, on the table for discussion? Some sort of hybrid process between Special land use and condition use processes. Yes. This is Mr. Uh, through the chair, this is Chris Schutte. Um, Dean, absolutely. I, I, our intent in providing the slideshow was to describe the processes as they exist today uh, so that um, committee members had a fuller understanding of those processes. 
And it's our expectation that the discussion you're about to hear probably will uh, move in a direction of a hybrid license. Right, I think we'll get to that. Um, I think I've got a couple more questions though in the okay. queue before we move into that awesome. particular Look discussion. forward to hearing that, how that would work. Yes, I'm sorry, I yield to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dean. Okay, uh, Ms. Zaltel. Actually, in the discussion, my question on enforcement um, was answered, um, and I did have Mandy email out um, one conceptualization of the hybrid process uh, just now um, to, it went to IMAS council, IMAS members. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, Mr. Constant, did you have another question, something to follow up on? I do actually. Um, so having just heard that whole chain of reason there, uh, this item will never come before the assembly and an assembly member may not even speak on the matter in its process any way in the chain along to its approval, I would submit that I believe this ordinance is dead letter. And uh, it's a failure to start because there's not a chance in hell I'm going to support and I'm going to actively fight against any ordinance that would provide these kind of uses without any say of the representative bodies and the representatives of the people who live in these neighborhoods. And so, uh, we really have to come up with a dual process, which is a license and a special land use permit, if the intent is to proceed with allowing shelters in the B3 zone, which I still support. But there's not a chance in hell I'm going to support it by granting the authority to the Planning and Zoning Commission. I stood in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission once and watched them make an approval like this. It was quite a horror to watch, and um, I'm not going to be a party to that. And I'm going to fight against that. So I do hope we quickly turn our attention to the real matter at hand, which is how do we create a licensing structure and uh, what does the special land use permit process look like for them? Great. Well, thank you, Mr. Constant. Yeah, I have some concerns too about where sometimes the uh, conversation ends and doesn't quite get to the assembly level. So I think we have to be careful on that too. So that's what we're probably uh, here to do. So, uh, Michelle, uh, Mr. Schutte, thank, thank you both um, for um, the presentation and the background and definitions. And I'll just say if, if there are any other questions from assembly members about the presentation or current practices, can you, um, you know, speak up now? And if not, we'll we'll move on to some. I have more. one. OK, go um, ahead, Dean. Yes, uh, I appreciate the mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. and so forth. And I would just mention. Uh, oh. Actually, um, Austin's leaving. Did Austin want to say anything before she left? No, I'm good. Happy Fourth of July, everyone. Okay. Great. Happy Thanks, Fourth. Austin. Yep. Okay. Okay, sorry. And I guess I would say the assembly isn't entirely left out of, condi of the conditional use process. The assembly's involvement is in the code, you know, you prove code amendments, and that's what this ordinance does, except this ordinance doesn't have any use specific standards. So I think that, you know, if there are some boiler, I mean, across the board, use specific standards included here that would address some of, I guess, the general or typical mm. or common concerns and issues that come up with homes, transit shelters and their impact on neighboring properties that this would be more palatable probably to Mr. Constant and Ms. Kennedy if, uh, because in code it would be required use specific standards or conditions um, and that the Planning Zoning Commission uh, couldn't waive except by a variance is, is my understanding. So this ordinance doesn't have any use specific standards and as we had in the presentation, there are some for uh, um, adult care facilities, was it? And there are some for other uh, uses. So I might suggest that if this ordinance had new specific standards for all these shelters, that this would be a lot more palatable. Okay, thank you, Dean. Um, got Mr. Constant in the queue again. So, Mr. Constant, go ahead. Thank you. So, I, I'm actually not very confident that use specific standards will provide us any protection. In the current paradigm, only the director can make the determination that a uh, an operation is in violation of the standards of their conditional use. And after many, many years of this conversation, 
we know that the director, it doesn't matter who it is, this is no strike at you, Michelle, uh, is not going to make a decision to shut down an emergency shelter because that's just too much political heat for one pointy <laughs> to deal with. And so I'm, I have pretty much zero or negative confidence in the application of use specific standards through the conditional use process, which leaves all of the burden of trying to make this work on the shoulders of the director. Thank you, Mr. Constant. It was, am I hearing somebody that wants to comment on that or? No, okay. Could Let's I ask something to follow up on that? Uh, if you'd like to, sure. So on enforcement, on enforcement, um, Cheryl, your slide show show part of the enforcement chapter. Uh, there's a section procedures for private enforcement actions. Would that be available to um, someone who thought or had evidence that uh, a conditional use wasn't complying with either the conditions of approval or the specific standards? 2113 and 60 for private enforcement actions to be an available remedy. Okay. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, I, I guess. I mean, I'm the director. Go ahead. Other, I mean, it's another option other than the director revoking from it. Okay. So. Can, um, Madam Chair, can you have Dean restate the last part of his question? I think it was. Okay, Dean, can you just repeat? Yes. Um, um, Section 211360s, private enforcement actions. Is that an available process for, I guess, if the director isn't going to revoke a, a, a conditional use? Is a private enforcement action another um, alternative approach? Can anybody take that one on, that question? Yeah, so I'm I'm reading this, and I don't know um, if Jack Frost you has- can address it later. Yeah, I, I, please let me let me have a moment. Thanks, G Dean. Yeah, let's move on, like Meg suggested. Okay, thank you. Um, all right. So next in the queue, we have Mr. Weddleton. Thanks, and I think I'm I'm looking for the direction, like um, Meg is asking for in her little comment here. Um, my my sense on this is that we are pointing towards some kind of hybrid thing. We'll have general conditional use requirements that may go through the planning commission, but that we want assembly control of this and um, through a special land use permit or a license or something like that. And I should say on, on the document that I provided with the whole list is um, that some of that you saw at our previous meeting of added stuff that um, Russ Webb and Stephanie Rhodes sent some uh, emails, but also they sent uh, some example MOUs from other homeless shelters, and I pulled pieces out of those and put them on here. And then I added things that from you know, the committee as well. So th that's kind of a big brainstorming list, but I think from there we should get some kind of um, fairly concrete parameters for what we would expect. Um, and I'm not sure how to split this up, though, between what would be normal for a condition of use, kind of the land use things, and then a license or a, or a uh, slop. OK, well, John, both you and Meg have um, some things to talk about, some things that you've worked on and and uh, written up. Um, do you have a suggestion as to who should go first? Oh, well, Meg, go first. Okay. I don't think we're done. And actually, I'm, I should say, you know, we we at this point, I think, have a work session scheduled. And my hope for this meeting would be to have um, um, pretty clear direction on what we're discussing, what we'll discuss at that work session. Um, well, we have 15 minutes left, um, so I don't know <laughs> how, how clear of a discussion uh, we're going to I have. I thought we were till noon. But I think we're just till 11. Uh oh. But, um, be quick, Meg. But. Anyway, yeah, I've got till 11. Um, so, uh, yeah, D Meg, do you want to go first? Just all the go ahead. Sure. Um, thank you. So I can be quick. Um, so I had Mandy send out that email and it really is a hybrid approach to a conditional use that then moves into a special land use process. Um, and it envisions the two-step process that we currently use under um, 
marijuana in particular, where there's a license um, plus the land portion. Um, and I think the breakdown, and I think Mr. Waddleton uh, raises a good point, is what goes where? What goes into the license and what goes into uh, the land use permit? And I think we honestly look at marijuana as our guide, um, what happens inside the building versus what happens outside the building. There'll be a little bit of overlap. Um, this hybrid approach, um, you know, I think gives planning and utilizes the planning and zoning process and really puts some good things that are in their wheelhouse uh, to make recommendations to us, but then gives us that assurance of being able to bring it back before us and make ultimate approval. It also preserves the public process, um, I think, in a real and meaningful way. Um, I have taken the comments that John shared with me from uh, Stephanie and Russ um, and the prior work on the licensing side, and I'm moving that forward to get it back to Dean. Um, the land use side, all I have is an idea um, and I haven't um, tried to undertake any code revisions there, but I think that that is really the only way I can seem to uh, mediate all of the concerns I've heard about shelter, both from the community and the members, and to have some checks and balances in that system um, that will alleviate a lot of the concerns that everyone seems to have. So that's my pitch for it or my explanation of it. Um, and I love any and all feedback. OK, that was very quick, Ms. Zolotel. Thank you. So and if you all didn't uh, see, uh, she does have an email that just kind of uh, ex explains the same thing that you just went over. So um, and that was sent at 1023 if you want to check that out. Um, so I've got a couple people in the queue. Mr. Weddleton, I think, was first. Why don't you go? I, I have kind of a question that's somewhat big and would probably just be better for staff to think about um, before our work session. So go ahead. I see Francis there. I'd like yeah, to go, yeah, let's do that. So Mr. McLaughlin, Francis, go ahead. Uh, thank you. So um, if you guys can hear me, the uh, marijuana and alcohol um, go uh, um, directly from uh, application, the planning department processes it directly to the assembly and skips the Planning and Zoning Commission. My understanding is that uh, Ms. Selatel is uh, proposing the hybrid that would go first to the Planning and Zoning Commission and then to the Assembly. Um, what uh, makes a little bit more sense to me um, within the framework of Title 21 is um, because the process, that hybrid process, it would be unique only to um, uh, homeless shelters if this were to be created. What makes sense to me is for uh, conditional use for the homeless shelter to continue to go to the Planning and Zoning Commission for decision, but that uh, separately licensure go to uh, the uh, assembly, um, you know, sort of the way that uh, alcohol does, um, where, um, you know, the assembly makes a decision on the alcohol. And I just uh, offer that up as a, um, uh, from someone that, you know, uh, works with Title 21, um, that, that sort of framework that I laid out where the Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission continues to have the um, conditional use permit for a homeless shelter and the assembly um, having control over a license the way it does for alcohol. Um, that makes the most sense to me. And I, I maybe don't know how to uh, describe why so well, but uh, um, I just say that the hybrid would only be unique to uh, homeless shelters, and uh, it just makes more sense to me to continue to follow the conditional use process that we have, but separately have the power, the licensure. And I guess just one other comment, which is that, um, you know, they would need both in order to operate. If they lost one, then, you know, they <coughs> wouldn't, they'd need both to be able to operate. Um, if uh, either one was revoked or abandoned, then then they, they couldn't be open. They're conditioned on each other. Um, thank you. Thank you, Francis. That was um, really, that was good. Um, but Meg has a question for you. So Ms. Solitel. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, great idea, Francis. Um, so I'm just thinking through how it might play out. And I've been thinking about some uh, problematic uh, alcohol operators we've had. Um, and it's felt like it was, uh, there was never any any enforcement of the conditional use side, uh, especially as to neighborhood impacts and what was kind of happening around the land, because I think 
the licensure as I contemplate it is kind of what's happening inside the building or it's the operation and then the conditional use really kind of goes more on um, the the lot and then possible neighborhood impacts. So could you talk with me a little bit more about that or if you have any thoughts about yeah, how that's, that's a, worked? Yeah, thank you, Ms. Silatel. I think, you know, what, what springs to mind is, you know, with uh, in and out I'm sorry, uh, mom and pop liquor or spirits of Alaska, when the assembly decided not to renew um, the license for those two package stores, they went out of business. Um, so I think that the assembly in the way that it holds the power over the license for alcohol uh, can exercise its power against uh, or, you know, to work with a homeless shelter um, that um, that the power would be solely with the assembly and there is uh, teeth to that. So I, I don't know if a, if a, if another um, alcohol establishment, a different liquor store were to come up to be a problem today, you know, the assembly could, um, uh, you know, uh, revoke, uh, revoke the license. Well, see, they would, okay. in, in the case of alcohol, they would be making a recommendation to revoke the license to the state AMCO. But in the homeless shelter situation, you just, you know, they wouldn't have a state licensure. It would just be the assembly deciding whether or not to renew or or continue or to re revoke um, a homeless shelter license. Um, I, I like that um, idea. Thank you. Um, interesting. Uh, quick follow up, though, is that when um, the, the public process is really more around the conditional use permit. And so that's the public's expectations of what's going to happen in the neighborhood. And I think that's where the frustration comes in terms of getting enforcement of those conditions. And those seem to rest outside of uh, the body. Um, and it might have nothing to do with what we've actually licensed, which is generally going to be the interior operations. So I just want to kind of toss that out as um, a potential downside or something that we would maybe need to look at as to strengthen in that situation. But it is a very intriguing idea. Thank you. Thanks. Madam Chair, may I offer a comment on that? Sure, Mr. Schutte, go ahead. This, Mr. Schutte, through the chair, Assembly Member Zalatel, that's a great point. And the analog in the uh, zoning world currently could be the neighborhood responsibility plan requirement for marijuana licensees. Okay. Thank you. Good comment. Okay, um, have a comment from Mr. Cox too. So go ahead, Chris. Thank you. Oh yeah, first I was going to address the the slight nuance that Francis caught at the very end that we don't actually license alcohol operators. Um, we see the problems of the alcohol license operators, but we license the marijuana operators. Their biggest problem is the smell if there's a a, a, a grow happening, and um, so that that's an important thing to keep in mind. And the issue of the question of how to address the land use questions in a license probably is comes back to what Francis had suggested, which is that each refers to the other and that the requirements of the land use, uh, the conditional use, which we really don't have some say in if they aren't met, could be uh, addressed in the licensing, which isn't necessarily indoor or outdoor operations if we reference the conditional use in the license itself. And that makes that a term that you have to meet the conditional use terms. Otherwise, you are subject to the revocation of your license. And so I think we could get there um, using a pretty clean approach, which is allow the uh, alcohol or excuse me, the, the homeless shelter operator to run through the planning and zoning commission through a standard process, which we would still want to put on use specific standards and then have our license, which we have much more flexibility. But I think it needs to be based on how clean and safe the operations are, the impacts to the neighborhood surrounding, and of course their um, their history in the community. So I think that we're getting close to a starting point for this conversation. I do too, thank you. Um, so let's see, okay, I just have a yes from Francis, so I'm assuming that uh, that's all the comment there, but um, Ms. Zolotel, you have a question again, so go ahead. So yeah, so I wanna kind of, push on this idea a little bit more. I, I think we're headed in the right direction here, but conditional use permits and their enforcement um, have kind of a bad rap, have like a bad PR image, I think, to some extent with the public. So I think I wanna, I wanna dive deeper into that because that is where the public comments 
um, if they have resonated with planning and zoning are memorialized in those conditions. It's kind of like the contract with the public. Um, and to, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with that part because I feel like to some extent with conditional use permits, whether it's been in the alcohol realm or uh, quite frankly with Brother Francis Shelter and that campus, we, we broke that public trust and that those conditions. Um, and so I want, I mean, I, I want us to be very cognizant of that and very diligent as we move forward. Whereas I don't get the same feeling that we've had a, the same issues in the special land use permitting process um, historically. But if I'm wrong, I would love to be educated about that. Thanks, Ms. Zolotel. Um, and if I, I might think I'm gonna leave, maybe leave that as a as a question, um, you know, maybe to, to go through a little bit more um, carefully later, if that's okay. Um, because I want to give Mr. Weddleton the last five minutes, or um, it's going to run out of time. But um, Dean on, did okay. Dean, you put a comment in there. Um, oh, you're just talking about what we could add. Yes, to the I was just going to mention. Uh, and this is Francis. Uh, um, so we constantly talk about uh, a license and the um, conditional use or special use being dependent on um, a license where the assembly would have authority over. Uh, I wanted to point out we have that sort of structure with the marijuana special land use permit code. If I could paste a section in here from 2105-055-A1B, um, it says that uh, if the municipal license is suspended or revoked, operations have to cease until the license is valid again. And so maybe wording like this in use specific standards for homeless transit shelter. If we have a licensing um, regime as well that the assembly has control over, the assembly suspends it, then they are the use must cease. And if they don't, um, then it's a violation of the condition of use. You know, so maybe language like this included. Whoops, sorry, there it is. <laughs> uh, I forgot to click the send. It's an idea to add something like some language like this with the corresponding licensing scheme. Yes. OK, and that makes sense. So. OK, well, can we move on? Just and, uh, you know, real briefly, Crystal, I think the point that Meg is making is, I think how I understand it is there's in some ways a branding problem with the conditional use uh, because people have in some ways come to not trust it. For me, code enforcement, except insofar as some alcohol operations go and the shelter, they're amazing and they're lions in this community. They do incredible work. And so um, if it's a marketing issue, I think we can overcome it pretty easily. And if it's more substantive, then it's going to be a deeper conversation. Thank you for your point, Meg. Yes, I agree. And I agree. And that's kind of why I thought, OK, I think we're going to have a bigger conversation on that, but I didn't want to end. Maybe we could just extend for a few minutes. Move to extend 10. Second. Second. All right, thank you. Is there any objection to extending for 10 minutes? And hearing none. OK, all right. So um, there's a comment from Michelle in the queue that says that was great suggested language, Dean. Um, but I also, OK, so I've got um, a question from Miss Allard. So. Hi, thank you, you guys. So I have a couple of concerns. I find that I'm probably quite outnumbered here, but I I have a concern that the public isn't truly being heard. And to for the potentially planning department, and I understand under emergency powers, for the assembly persons to not have input and not be able to vote on such matters is really um outrageous and I say that because we are the voices that were elected by our constituents to represent them and to bypass us completely in a matter that could be taken a tiny bit slower I just I, I can't wrap my head around that so I, I in that regards I'm I'm standing right there with Mr. Constant on just leaving the assembly out is just it's it's just not the way our our government should be ran the other thing is I, the voices 
of the people out. Look, I went to a meeting on Monday in regards to the um, homeless rehab, and there are really big concerns. And they, they have come together. They're not being heard. They feel like they're not being heard. They believe they're not being heard. And I actually believe that, too. And I think we all need to kind of step back because we have a homeless community. I don't know the actual numbers, 1,200 plus that are dictating what happens in our society of over 279,000 Anchorage community residents. And I just, the numbers for us to satisfy those needs in a way that our Anchorage community members, all the way from Girdwood to Klutna, we have to come together better, you guys. And we need to figure out how we can involve the community more instead of just saying, okay, we have COVID funds, we're gonna move as fast as possible. That's, that's not the right answer. We have to come up with a plan. We need to be able to implement it and we need to be able to execute it. And I'm just, I think we're going about this the wrong way. Thank you. So thank you, Ms. Allard. Um, and actually, I think, I think we all have those same concerns and that's why um, you know, we, we've seen where well, we're having this conversation. And I think that's why um, uh, Meg and John have both um, put a lot of um, effort into trying to figure out how to kind of solve this problem to make it more public friendly. So we're working on it. Um, I don't see this particular ordinance going through anytime soon, uh, you know, for an actual vote. Uh, and we do have a work session on it. But again, um, John, you've written like four pages of kind of how we move this a little bit forward. Uh, similar to what Meg said, you know, coming up with this hybrid idea. So um, I want to give you time to talk about what you've put up or what you've written out. So go ahead, John. Sure, you know, um, what I would ask, I think, to move this forward is for staff to look at that document, which is really just a, it is just a draft. It's brainstorming, it's throwing stuff from a variety of sources in there. It's probably missed a bunch, but it's things that we've discussed and from other sources. And if, if staff could go through and say, OK, well, this is something that would be good as a conditional use um, guidance. And then these ones would be good as the uh, a license within a license. Uh, and then maybe note some as no, don't touch this or maybe this is covered somewhere else um, just to kind of tighten that up and. Um, and then have that ready for the work session so that we because I, I think we're pretty clearly going towards something that um, would be like a conditional use is um, more typical, like Francis said, and then a license that um, gives the assembly lots of input and control. So take those um, points in that document, and split those up, and, and then something in there that doesn't really fit any of those well, I think, is a commitment on the side of the city. And that would be um, where we would have, um, you know, no tolerance for camping within a quarter mile or half a mile of the shelter. We commit to having police patrols on some schedule or something, you know, things like that, that um, you can't really expect a provider to do, um, but the community expects that. And we, you know, if we absolutely have a hold of climb out of because we've done such a poor job down on Third Avenue and we need to have solid commitments that, um, will include things that only the city can do. So, so somehow work that in too. So it's almost like we have three things, you know, the conditional use, the license um, requirements, and also what the city commits to doing and, and see how we can get those together. Um, that may draw some comments from Michelle and Chris. Uh, through the chair, I, I have my hand up, but I'll just jump in if that's okay. OK, go ahead. I've got several people in line. Yeah, sorry yes, about that. Um, thank you, Assemblymember Weddleton. Um, and just to be clear, the the document that you and Assemblymember Kennedy are referring to was the uh, Word document notes that Mandy sent around earlier. Uh, it was. We She sent it this morning, and it's... Um, OK. It just starts out homeless and transient shelters in B3 recommendations for conditional use permit draft thoughts Don Weddleton date date date. Excellent. OK, just wanted to clarify and um, to your uh, comment or your, your request that uh, we have that staff take an opportunity to go through these thoughts. For, uh, we also have some thoughts in a separate attachment that was forwarded from Assemblymember Zalatel 
um, we would be happy to do that and begin to uh, make recommendations on how to segregate the different um, concepts that are in there into appropriate columns related to uh, conditional use versus license, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what was the what's, what is the date of the work session, if you if you don't mind? Yeah, I'm looking that up too. Um, July 10th. Yes. OK. All right, we will do that. Thank you. OK, well, there's still a couple of people. Let's see. Um, uh, got Meg back in the queue, so Ms. Solitel, go ahead. Um, thanks, Ms. Kennedy. Um, so question, I don't know if there's a quick answer to, but it could be something we address. Is it on a conditional use permit, is there a way to impose automatic conditions based on a type of use um, as a matter of course? So this is Michelle. I, th I think your best bet would be to try to make them use specific standards. That's always going to ensure that those items are addressed. Um, but we we, we do have typical conditions of approval for specific uses, um, but I think so they have more teeth and that they don't get negotiated. If you feel strongly about it, it should be a use specific standard if it's appropriate. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. Okay, thanks, Ms. Solitel. Uh, Mr. Constant. Thanks. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we're talking about the same things here. Uh, John just made a, a really clear kind of communication about the importance of certain commitments to be made by the municipality. You have land use licensing and these list of commitments. I think, I, I'm not sure yet, I'm just starting to chew on this, but I think that those items are likely going to or should be um, location specific as opposed to um, generally applicable principles. Um, there might be some things that we agree to that are generally applicable. And I don't know where a list of municipal commitments fits into all of this kind of in the terms of a neighborhood responsibility plan. It would be this is what we say we will do. But um, it's like we're talking about both of the issues that are kind of coming up before us. One is the purchase of the land and one is this zoning change. And so I'm hopeful that we're really careful to keep those two items very separated from each other because ultimately they are two very distinct issues. So, um, but I do like the idea of us coming up with a measure of commitments that the municipality will make toward the operation of these uh, potential shelters. Um, but I think that's slightly different than the zoning question that's before us. I'm not sure. Well, I would agree with you, Mr. Constant. I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it, and that's the way I try to look at, you know, obviously dealing with code is you try to take it at face value, not necessarily what might be going on behind the scenes. However, it is hard to do that at this time because this is such a, a, a big thing um, that's going on. But I agree with you that we're, right now we're dealing with a code change um, and how to make this work for the potential uses that we think it will be, i.e. homeless shelters. So um, kind of wrapping it up, John, did you have anything else that you wanted to um, talk about uh, with, uh, with, with your um, comments? Anything else you wanted to highlight or? No, it sounds like uh, Shudi kind of recapped it well. Um, I would say one thing on the agenda that I had sent out is since 2019, so be sure to correct that on your. 2019, right. okay, got it, thank you. Okay, Oops. all right, uh, Mrs. Zalatel, you've got, uh, a question about this. yes thanks yeah so conditional use and special land use are not cheap processes um, and what we're talking about here is operating homeless and transient shelters which are not money-making operations so i want to bring the idea of the fees to the forefront um, and so we can maybe just start thinking about that um, they're not processes that usually uh, are done without counsel or some kind of expertise so again um, just want to toss that out there because I don't want a, you know tens of thousands of dollars that you know in the process getting in the way of people wanting to do this work and do it well okay Right, so I don't know if there'd be any comments on that, but that's certainly something to put into the mix um, as we move forward with this. Excuse me. 
Okay, so Ms. McNulty, you had a question on the work session. So Michelle, go ahead. I, I guess I just wanted clarification from the assembly that as we're looking at these changes, um, are you, is your thought that this would only be applicable to when the homeless and transient shelter is introduced into the B3, or would we be looking at making whatever changes we're doing um, into the PLI zoning district as well? Because it's already in allowed as a conditional use. This use yes. is already allowed. Yes to both, Christopher. Yes, uh, you know, what, what the Thanks. problem has been is the failure to address the ongoing impacts. And so please, yes, let's make it a requirement of those that are operating. I just want to clear. I, I shared the sentiment as well. That we want to make it apply eventually across the board to all homeless and transient shelters. Thank you. Really, and the I, last slight wrinkle to that is we have a number of them that are operating in an emergency status um, that will, when they have the opportunity, convert to a permanent status. And so any question about grandfathered rights on those operations should be easy to get around or work with. Uh, it might be slightly different with our friends at Catholic Social Services because they have a conditional use and no license, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. I So just to point out a real quick point of clarification on that, that won't be a problem. Anybody who is operating under a temporary shelter or um, condition, they don't automatically get grandfathered into having a conditional use. If they want to move into permanent status, they have to apply for the conditional use permit application. So that's everybody except Brother Francis Shelter. Um, and then also um, the one on Tudor um, Rescue Mission. There's, I think there's two or three that are operating under um, approved conditional uses. So they would only be subject to the new requirements if they changed something and had to go through a CUP amendment. Um, anybody else who's operating under the temporary ordinance would be required um, as part of going into permanent status to go through the conditional use permit application process. Okay, um, any final comments? It looks like we're... I'll just say thank you. Uh, we definitely made progress today. Good, thank you. Yeah, we kind of threw some more things back into um, permitting's lap, uh, planning and um, development's lap, but um, I think that's going to help us get uh, going on this a little bit better on the uh, with the work session. So I appreciate all the um, background um, feedback, um, Michelle and Chris, and um, thank John and Meg for uh, getting a lot of this stuff uh, kind of written down and getting questions out there so that we know um, how to kind of move forward and get this a little better formulated. So we have a work session, like John said, on the 10th, and um, I guess we'll be talking more then. So um, anyway, no other final, if there's no other final comments, we'll adjourn. Can we double check on uh, public? Public what, John? A public comment. I'm not sure if anyone's even there, but uh, we can do that. Um, any public comment? Uh, I really don't even know who all is on, so Mandy, you can help me with that. Um, and I would suggest that if there's any public comment, probably the easiest thing to do in this situation would be to unmute yourself with star six and let us know who you are. It looks like the only unknown person is at 2442125. Yes. Hey, that's Nick Miller. Sorry, I was just listening in. Okay, well, thanks, Nick. So, yeah, if you don't have any comments, then um, that's great. I, if you do, I don't. please go ahead. Okay, all right. Okay, well, then uh, I think we're wrapping this up then. And uh, if there's no objection, uh, we're adjourned. All right, good. Thanks, Crystal. All right. Thanks, everybody.